The Tao Te Ching is the canonical text of the religion we know in the West as Taoism. What we know about Taoism is limited, and as we'll discuss in this video, there are many layers to this onion, and together we're going to peel apart the layers to find out truly what lays beneath the surface. On the first layer of this onion is the layer of what we understand Taoism to be in the West. What could be said in the surface level glance is that Taoism was founded by an ancient Chinese philosopher called Lao Tzu. He wrote the book, The Tao Te Ching, and the book itself is something you can find in the self-help section of the bookstore, next to Weight Loss for Dummies and The Secret. You're a Gemini? That's crazy. So is my goldfish. The second layer is what Chinese people see. Taoism encompasses a vast and enigmatic culture. There are Taoist temples, intricate traditions, long-standing rituals, and a pantheon of gods. The concepts of Taoism are central to the majority of the cultural stables from Feng Shui to Chinese medicine, from martial arts to Qigong, from astrology to Zen Buddhism. In the research of this profound and esoteric school of thought, I feel as if I've uncovered a great mystery. What we are going to discuss in this video is, what is the Tao Te Ching? What is Taoism? What do Taoists really believe in? Who is Lao Tzu? Where did Taoism come from? Come join me on this epic journey, as there are many profound mysteries to be revealed. By the way, my English and Chinese speaking brain gets words mixed up sometimes, so don't be alarmed if I say Taoism, then say Taoism in the next sentence. It's all the same. As we all know, the Tao Te Ching is the principal text for the religion we know as Taoism, with its writer and founder being the man Lao Tzu. But for those who have read the Tao Te Ching, there isn't much to be said about the plethora of Taoist rituals, traditions, and its pantheon of gods, and as for Lao Tzu, there isn't any real indication that he existed in the first place. So our dive into the sacred book is in fact very unrevealing about the world of Taoist religion, and despite the modern world's connectivity and its seemingly omnipotent nature, Taoism is still shrouded in layers of mystery, not only for a Western audience, but even a Chinese one. So let's discuss the Tao Te Ching further. For those who haven't read the Tao Te Ching, the primary purpose of the book is to instill the reader with knowledge of the Way, in Chinese known as Tao. I like to summarize the Tao as the natural order of the universe, and to walk its path is to seek to be optimally in tune with its unchangeable way. In other words, a state of universal natural order. A breakdown of the character Tao will tell us some of the components of this esoteric concept. Now there's no one way to look at this character, as there are a multitude of interpretations for this commonly used character, but this bottom radical here represents walking on a path. This middle radical represents the self, and this top radical here can be thought of as the yin and yang lines from the 8 trigram belief system, but don't worry about that. In sum total, the walking represents the road that you walk on, the way. I think of it as a journey to higher understanding. The self part of the character implies that this sacred way, the Tao, is something that resides within you, and the journey that takes place is within oneself. And lastly, the yin yang represents the dualistic nature of all things. The Tao Te Ching is a collection of what I like to call sutras. Every line can be described as a concise, short to the point, laconic, and memorable statement. What compounds this laconic nature further is the nature of the Chinese language itself, which can be very sharp and cutting and quick to the point. Ah, of course, of course. But at the same time, each character has a deep depth of meaning to it, and what's being said doesn't require further description. I think this kind of language is perfect for an esoteric book like the Tao Te Ching. So within a chapter, there are maybe five lines, and every line may consist of as little as seven characters. For a book with only 81 chapters, it would seem like an extremely short read. However, pondering over each character, each word, and each sentence can take a long time. I personally imagine a Taoist monk reading one line, then sitting in silence for an hour, contemplating and meditating on it. Such a book isn't meant to be consumed. Each line is an aphorism that, in reflection of the word's meaning, brings you to the place that the author is trying to take you to. Let's look at the first few lines. Dao ke dao, fei chang dao, ming ke ming, fei chang ming, wu ming tian di zhi shi, you ming wan nu zhi mu. The Tao that can be spoken of is not the ever-constant Tao. The name that can be named is not the ever-constant 
name. That which is without name is the beginning of heaven and earth. That which possesses a name is the mother of the ten thousand creatures. What on earth could this mean? I want to give you an exercise to follow right now so you can get in tune with the inner state of the Tao. Close your eyes and think, what is my next thought? That feeling you had just now is not something you can describe, but what you've experienced for a brief moment is you at your most natural self, not actively analyzing what the Tao is, not thinking of words to describe the Tao, you're not measuring it, you're not comparing it to other things you know, it's just you in the moment, firsthand experiencing what it is. You're experiencing the inner state of the universal natural order of things and with that you have inner peace and a higher sense of self-awareness. So the Tao that is spoken of can't be the actual Tao. It's implying that the words themselves are a false substitute for what this natural order of things is. How exactly can you know what it is through mere words? Imagine if you had some sort of eye condition that make you see things on the color spectrum that others couldn't and you could see a color you like to call blue pool and I've never seen it before. How exactly could you describe it to me? There aren't any words that could be a sufficient substitute for what it is you're trying to describe and that's like trying to describe the Tao. Dao ke Dao, fei chang Dao, ming ke ming, fei chang ming. I believe many of the lines in this book have a contradictory nature that can't easily be digested by the mind. This is a passage, for instance, that's likeness is not uncommon throughout the book. Quote, Therefore, being and non-being create each other. Difficult and easy complete each other. Long and short contrast each other. High and low lean on each other. Tone and voice harmonize each other. Before and after follow each other. End quote. Here, a Taoist monk sitting on a hilltop somewhere. He reads one line and meditates on the idea for an hour. Why would he do this? Well, according to Zhuangzi, who is second only in importance to Laozi in Taoist thought, a principal aim is to achieve a state called qi wu. A direct translation is equal things. Zhuangzi believes that the pathological state of human consciousness causes people to focus on the ever-changing surrounding environment, like dislike, right, wrong, hot, cold, up, down, as opposed to zooming out and seeing the connectivity between the polar opposites of all things. This binary nature of all things is represented in the yin-yang symbolism. On the one hand, the black and white are distinct from each other, but at the same time within the circle, they are one. I don't believe that the symbolism of yin yang is to imply that there is no difference between yin and yang, otherwise what you'd be looking at is just a grey blob. Instead what you see is yin and yang and yin yang together as a whole. What Zhuangzi believes is that if you master qi wu, the high state of spiritual liberalization one can achieve is what is called xiao yao, which means to be free and unfettered. It means by no longer myopically focusing on the binary nature of reality, happy, sad, fortune, misfortune, war, peace, if you transcend this paradigm, you can achieve inner peace. Such thought is the basis of the Zen practice. Imagine a monk meditating on a frigid mountain peak. He should be freezing to death, but within his mind's eye, he contemplates the sameness of hot and cold, the sameness of pain and pleasure, the sameness of comfort and discomfort. He steps out of this dichotomy, and he is in the inner state of Xiao Yao, thus he is not disturbed by his outer environment. So now you are enlightened. Just kidding. But it's a start. So now we've covered the Tao Te Ching. I want to now bring the conversation to Taoism itself. I just want to point out that I've been getting a lot of information from Liang Wen Dao. So if you speak Chinese, definitely check him out. He's really amazing and I watch him a lot. What he points out in his analysis of Taoism is that there's a clear disconnect between Tao Jia, a Taoist practitioner, Tao Jia, the religion of Taoism, and Lao Tzu, the founder of the religion. 
So followers of Taoism, the religion of Taoism, and the founder of Taoism, and I would even argue its canonical text, the Tao Te Ching, are all separated from each other by varying degrees, and I consider this to be very interesting. So let's look at Taoism, the religion. To be considered a Taoist, it doesn't matter where you are from or what language you speak or whether you go to the Taoist temple to pray to the gods, you simply have to be a follower of the Way, aka the teachings of the Tao. But attached to the religion are a multitude of colourful rituals, traditions and the pantheon of gods I mentioned. What exactly does the Tao Te Ching say about the god of wealth, for instance? Absolutely nothing. What does it say about the way in which to sacrifice a pig and the time of day it should be done. Of course, nothing. What does it say about um, marriage rituals and the like? Uh, of course, nothing. Uh, funnily, funnily enough, on that note, uh, one of my first encounters with Taoism was when living in Taiwan. Um, every few blocks there would be a temple and it would be decked out in gold and red colors and fancy decorations. And there were a lot of rituals you had to follow when you were going inside. And once inside, uh, there's a number of scary looking statues that look like they're decoration for a Chinese version of Halloween. And I remember one time walking outside my home near the temple and I saw a whole street's worth of slaughtered pigs just skewered on a pole. Um, and this was um, this is some kind of sacrificial offering ritual. Uh, if you have more information about this, please leave a comment below as I'd still love to find out. Um, so what is all this? And what is its connection with Taoism? Was this all the invention of Lao Tzu? After all, he's credited as being the founder of the religion, right? As uh, Liang Wendao points out, there's no definitive proof that Lao Tzu existed. And I know what you may be thinking. This is an all too often argument used to discredit historical religious figures. It's the book, I read it on Snopes. But the reason Liang Wendao gives is the time from which he emerged, which was a period known as the Spring and Autumn period, and the period after, which is known as the Warring States period, no scholars make mention of him or the word Dao Jiao. Uh, this is a big deal considering that during the same time, scholars were writing heavily about the two other prolific philosophical giants of the day, Confucius and Mozi. Um, in modern day China, People often speak of the two primary native philosophies of China, calling them uh, Ruo Dao, uh, Confucianism and Taoism. But during the very time of Lao Tzu, not a single person mentioned him in writing despite supposedly being a contemporary of Confucius and living during his lifetime. And people would only write of Ru Mo, uh, Confucianism and Moism. It's not until the great Chinese historian Sima Qian wrote of Lao Tzu approximately 400 years later that we get a mention of him. And considering that Sima Qian wrote that Lao Tzu lived to be 160 years old and, and he personally met with Confucius, which is highly improbable, there's a good reason to doubt the veracity of his statements and assume that he was writing of Lao Tzu based on legends, no different to what we've been doing. Liang Wendao, in accordance with what is currently the accepted theory amongst Chinese scholars, is that the Tao Te Ching was a conglomeration of texts written by Taoist thought leaders over many generations. Each edition was passed to the next generation of students who tweaked it, perhaps they started their own following, then the next generation of followers take it and then make editions of their own, until many generations later, the origins of the book had become obfuscated and shrouded in mystery, and its origins would simply become attributed to Lao Tzu, which isn't even a real name, it just means old one really, and was perhaps even used within the context of elder, like our elder wrote it. Things are complicated even further when the very word Taoism is thrown into question. Dao Jiao, as it's called in Chinese, isn't mentioned at all within the context of referring to the religion itself until the Northern and Southern Dynasties period in the 5th century. So was there no Taoism until the 5th century AD? No. As Liang Wen Dao put it, there is ample evidence that Taoism was in fact widespread during the spring and autumn period. The practices and thought of Taoism is a notable element of society, but it didn't have the name Taoism. So what was it called? It didn't have a name. It wasn't called anything. It was just there, as if it had always been there. What this thing is, which we know now is called Taoism, doesn't have a start date, nor does it have a founder, it's just always been. To compound this mystery further, let's actually talk about the Tao Jiao itself, Taoism the religion. Taoism isn't just a manual on attaining inner peace, it's also a science of sorts. How can that be? Well, 
What are some of the integral aspects of Taoism? First that comes to mind is Chinese alchemy. Unlike Buddhism, where the end goal is to achieve nirvana in death, the unabashed goal of Taoism is to changsheng bu si, de dao cheng xian. That literally means to grow old without dying and to become an immortal. Traditional Taoists believe that one can achieve immortality through the practice of Taoism, but through these Taoist principles, the study of alchemy developed where practitioners seek to transmute the elements and to cheat death. It's from these practitioners that we have the development of things like traditional Chinese medicine, where concepts such as achieving the balance of yin yang throughout the body is the way to achieve optimum health and by combining different herbs that represent aspects of the five elements, one can prolong their life and prevent disease. In addition to this, we have acupuncture, cupping, feng shui, qi gong, tai chi and various schools of martial arts. All these things come from the elements of Taoism. Even astrology, astronomy, fortune telling, spells, exorcism, shamanism, and many more all come from Taoism, if it can even be called that. So in the end, where on earth do all these things come from? We've established it didn't come from one man, Lao Tzu. It didn't come from its canonical text, the Tao Te Ching. There was no word for Taoism, and it's something that has always been with no start date. If you wanted to make a case for ancient aliens or an advanced ancient civilization, then that wouldn't be so far-fetched in this circumstance. I mean, where did it come from? To get to the root of it, what do the traditional accounts of how Lao Tzu came to this knowledge came from? Supposedly, Lao Tzu was a scholar who worked as the keeper of archives for the royal court of Zhou, where he had broad access to the literary works of the Yellow Emperor. The Yellow Emperor is the first emperor in Chinese civilization who is considered to be the originator of Chinese 5,000 year long history and what we know as the Mandate of Heaven. Every single Chinese emperor's claim to legitimacy throughout history was that they were the son of heaven and traced their legacy to the lineage of the Yellow Emperor who was considered to be a god. Traditional Chinese Taoists actually in fact regard the first mythical founding emperor of China, the Yellow Emperor, as being the true origin of Taoist thought. Although none of this can technically be proven, there is some reason why this would be believed. For one, an ancient set of manuscripts called the Huangdi Si Jing, a long lost but recently rediscovered text which had often been mentioned as the earliest influence of Taoist thought was credited to the writings of the Yellow Emperor according to ancient scholars. Moreover, the Huangdi Nei Jing, in English, the inner canon of the Yellow Emperor, was another book supposedly written by this mythical emperor. This book is regarded as the foundational text for traditional Chinese medicine, going back 5,000 years. I will say, however, it is entirely reasonable to believe that the legendary Yellow Emperor was probably also the subject of mythologizing tall tales just like Lao Tzu was. But what is certain is that the foundation of Taoism goes back as far as Chinese civilization itself, but the lore gets even deeper, with what is considered to be the most influential book for Taoism's existence, and it's a book called the I Ching, which is a book I've mentioned in previous videos. It also goes by the name The Book of Changes. Whilst this book was supposedly compiled in the 10th century BC during the Western Zhou period as a divination text, even for people at the time, they believed its true origins were far more ancient. The text is attributed even further back than the Yellow Emperor's time to the age of Chinese creation mythology. In Chinese mythology, there was a giant sleeping within an egg of chaos. When he was born, he stood up and divided the heavens from the earth, and upon his death, immediately upon birth, his body became the rivers, the mountains, the plants, and living things of the world, and amongst these beings was the most powerful being called Hua Shu. She gave birth to a twin brother and a twin sister, Fu Xi and Nu Hua, who were said to be half human, half snake. Hmm, no other ancient civilization has half reptilian gods that were the progenitors of the human race and taught them all these crazy things. This reality that we're experiencing has been hijacked by a force that some ancient people call archons, but there's different names right across the ancient world. The same force, the same entities. This is where the penny drops. When all these different names for the gods all over the world turn out to be different names for the same force because they're described in the same way. I need to take a break for a bit. The 
point is, Fushi, this reptilian humanoid giant god, is considered to be the original human and the progenitor of the human race. And from this demigod, we have many arts, sciences, and sorcery. And amongst the things that he bequeathed to us humans was the I Ching itself. So what is the I Ching? What is it about the I Ching that people feel like only a god could have written it? The I Ching is its own mystical science of divination. It uses its own system of numerology where a randomly generated set of numbers and hexagrams are used to predict things. There are many different methods of getting this randomly generated number. The throwing of coins, sticks or a specialized dice. Heck, even modern day practitioners developed Python code so they could get better generated random numbers for use of practice in their aging divinations. But one of the most well recognized and ancient ways was the use of what are called oracle bones. You may have heard of these bones before as being the earliest evidence of writing in the ancient Chinese world dating back 6000 BC, and the sole purpose of these oracle bones was for divination purposes. The practitioner would carve characters on the backs of turtle shells or on the bones of ox shoulder blades to ask a question. They would then heat up a tool and use it to crack the bone and from there they would observe the way the bone cracked in order to get the right data used for the divination method. It's almost as if the I Ching's ability to interpret these random sequence of numbers is the I Ching's connection to a higher power. And don't take my word for it though, it's people from now up till time immemorial that consider it themselves to be a supernatural text. People gather information from these divination tactics, use this information to make more precise divinations and get even more refined information, and from this they supposedly learn things they perhaps never would have been able to figure out on their own otherwise. You wouldn't be wrong to think this stuff is hocus pocus, that's totally fine, but it's from the I Ching that the development of things like Chinese astrology, astronomy, alchemy, weather forecasting, and of course Taoism came from. Not to mention the influence on many schools of thought and philosophy, Confucianism, Chinese Buddhism, legalism, all these huge fields of knowledge were either developed through the divination practices of the I Ching itself, or was partly practiced to help with the decision making process and developing ideas. And regardless of whether you believe this woo woo or not, bare minimum on a cultural level, the I Ching is one of the oldest and most important books ever written, and it's so foundational to the development of Chinese civilization it would be impossible to imagine Chinese society without such a text ever existing. We have no modern day explanation for what this is, how it works, where it even came from. So there you have it guys. As the Lord of the Rings puts it so eloquently, history became legend, legend became myth. We've journeyed through the layers of this onion and deep inside there is an even greater mystery to solve. But the journey was fun regardless and I'm happy you joined me along the way. It takes me a long time to research between uploads so help me out. If you have some interesting observations or some factoids you'd like to share with me, share with everyone in the comment section below. It's much appreciated. Leave a like if you like this video and I'll see you later.